just wanted to show you the, the Scala 99 problems. These are pretty cool. Um, so these are the kinds of things that they'll ask you to do in uh, Scala 99. Oh, let's do it again. You know, it's uh, fi find the last element of a list, find, uh, find the kth element of a list. Pretty basic stuff, but um, they, get, they get pretty hard pretty quick. Uh, run length encoding, duplicate the elements, and I think down here, determine whether our number is prime. Um, so it's got, uh, it's got some recursion challenges. Um, so it's pretty neat. I, I haven't gotten through all of them, that's for sure. But you know, you get through the first uh, the first twenty or so, you get a really good feel for just the basics. I mean, most of the time when you're writing Spark code, you're not really doing anything super fancy, at least at first. A lot of times you're just calling libraries and things like that. Um, but there, but there's this, there's this, uh, the ETL phase is when you're, you know, you're extracting uh, data from. Uh, if you're extracting data and you're trying to process it into a you know a data frame or something like that, these kinds of uh, tricks will come in handy. That's for sure. So um, so it's really great if you if you have some time. It, they're not too bad and they have uh, they have solutions. So um, you'll be able to take a look at the solutions. Uh, notice that the solutions are in singleton objects. So um, you don't necessarily have to uh, put them in an object. You can just uh, you know define them. And run them as a script from the shell. So um, you can get surprisingly far in Scala without having to compile. Um, and I'll even show you some tricks in Spark where you know you can define functions in a separate script and then load those functions as part of your initialization. And that'll that's sort of instead of instead, or you can compile them and, and import them and have access to the methods that way. But um, but it's nice because. Um, you can, you know, if you if you're accustomed to using an IDE, you can you can get on the you can get on your cluster and just kind of do these ad hoc edits uh, on the cluster uh, rather than going through the whole dev cycle of compiling and deploying and all of all of that. So it can make for a fast uh, dev cycle in certain cases. Um, but let's see. So we'll go into uh, um, components of. Uh, Components of uh, components of Spark. Um, we'll uh, so so the the, um, the, it, the Spark application has basically three three components. One is a data storage layer. Um, the other one is an API, which is the interface, uh, which is typically Scala. We're, we like to encourage you to use Scala, but um, we've got Java and Python, and also R. And, uh, and then we have something called the cluster management framework. So now we're all running Spark on our, our laptops today, but this is really designed to run on a cluster. So everything that we're doing is just kind of you know, a sandbox for, for the time when we actually you know, get our code working on a, on a cluster. So um, the, the frameworks, and we'll talk about them, are, there are three frameworks. One is called uh, standalone. Mesos and Yarn, and I think Kubernetes uh, may also become uh, 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 a cluster management framework, but I'm not too sure about that. Uh, he'll hear more about that uh, shortly. But these are the these are the historically these are the ones uh, the three main ones. So Mesos is not used as much. So L Yarn is by far the most used if you're on a multi-tenant cluster where you have lots of different applications running on the same cluster because Yarn is like the default uh, resource manager for uh, most Hadoop clusters. So Yarn stands for yet another resource negotiator and it basically just manages all of the jobs that are running on the cluster. The other one that you'll see a lot is if you just have your own, let's say you have a data lake type model where You've got a bunch of unstructured data sitting on a Hadoop cluster, and you and a small team of data scientists have exclusive access to that cluster, and that, and you're not running anything else but Spark. You can use a standalone mode, which would would just Spark will uh, create its own cluster management uh, framework. So, so this, a lot of times it's a lot easier to install because then you don't have to install Yarn. 
Um, so standalone does not mean it's running on a single node. Standalone means it's, it's, a, it's a standalone framework where it's, Spark is the only thing that's running on the cluster, but it's still running on a cluster. So the nomenclature always was a little confusing for me. But, uh, but those are the three uh, cluster management frameworks. Um, but the one you'll see a lot is Yarn, um, for sure. Um, so this is a little bit um, uh, of what the Spark ecosystem is. It's got, um, it's got Spark Core, which is really all of the cluster management uh, machinery uh, built into it. And then it's got uh, some other libraries like Spark SQL, uh, Spark Streaming, uh, Machine Learning Library, uh, GraphX, and then there are other connectors here. This is just one instance of a connector, but there are lots and lots of database connectors. Uh, and also things like Spark R uh, integration. So, so all of this sits on top of something called Spark Core, which manages all of the, uh, all of the parallelism. So it's, it's the base engine for all the, the parallel computing. It does all of the task scheduling. It does all the memory management. It handles all of the fault recovery. So we mentioned briefly about when, what an RDD is, is when you, when you, when you load the data and you, you, put a, you, you put it through a series of operations and that node that you were doing the calculations on crashes, how does it rebuild that to not only to the place where it loaded, but to the state that it was at when it, when it crashed. And that's all done by, by Spark Core. Um, it interacts with the file systems. So all of the, all of the sort of low level uh, stuff that, that you would expect kind of a framework uh, to do. Um, it also holds this API called the RDD, which we will um, talk, talk about. So, so these are the three cluster manage managers. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Yarn is the, is the one that, that you see the most. Uh, it was actually originally written for, for Mesos. Um, and, um, but in general, w w at least for our use cases, um, we don't see it used as much. But, uh, but I, I believe it's still used um, in, in practice. So this is kind of what a Spark program looks like. It's got a, it's got a driver program. That's where you, where, you, where you open up your Spark. If you were to open Spark shell, you would be sitting on the driver program. If you're running a Spark, uh, if you're just running an application, you would also be running it from the driver program. That has this creature called the Spark Context, which is the window to the entire machinery. So all things Spark happen through the Spark Context. Spark Context talks to a cluster manager, and then the cluster manager sends out uh, job requests to worker nodes. So these worker nodes have this notion of an executor. And so an executor is this persistent container that sits on a worker node. So you can have a worker node that it can have multiple executors. And all of, the, you know, all of those executors can receive a particular job. So it's a persistent container that gets job requests from the resource negotiator, which is yarn, usually, or a standalone. So you can have all, all of these distributed throughout the uh, out the codes. Now the executor, within the executor, it's processing a series of tasks. Those tasks have access to a cache and they have uh, access to shared memory. They also talk to each other during the, uh, during the process um, as well. Now if it needs to return results, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't go through the cluster management, it just sends the results directly back to, um, directly back to the Spark context. So, so this is the, you know, I would say the basic, the basic idea behind it. One of the things that's kind of neat about the executors is once you create the executor, it persists for the lifetime of the job in general. Because in previous cases, they had this thing called a mapper, which would only exist for the duration of a particular calculation, and then it would be, and then so you'd have all these uh, containers that had to be spun up and spun down. In this case, the containers persist throughout if it's not dynamically allocated, it, it persists throughout the lifetime of the, um, of the job and then it can receive job requests and so it, it, it can have, this is, the, this is that note, it, it can have some uh, persistence um, and, and make things a little bit more efficient. 
It can also store things in memory uh, throughout the lifetime of the job and, and all of that. So that was a big, that was a big change in, in, in the way MapReduce operations were done versus uh, Spark jobs. Um, I think we've covered a, a fair amount of these uh, now. Um, so application is uh, the program that you're writing. The driver program is, uh, is the process that's running it. Um, your cluster management, you've got your three flavors. Uh, the worker node houses the executors. The executors are receiving the jobs. Tasks are units of work that uh, land in the executors' um, uh, uh, jobs. And then a job is something that has got a series of tasks and a stage is also, uh, I can't remember which one is uh, which, I think, yeah. It's job give it, uh, that's right. So a stage has got a, se a sequential nature to it. So um, the Spark uh, context is, um, again, the main, the main uh, creature that, that sort of lives on the, on the driver and directs all of the, the jobs. Um, it get, you know you use it to create all of the data types that that that, that you're going to be doing Spark uh, operations on, and for Spark shell, the Spark context is automatically initialized. So usually, when you spin up Spark shell, the first thing you do is type SC, that is short for Spark context, just to make sure it if it gets in, if that is able if that's initialized, you'll get a, a value return for that. If it's not then maybe something didn't get, didn't get initialized uh, properly. So if you're having trouble getting the Spark context, um, let me know and we'll, we'll troubleshoot it. Most of the time it's you have to de delete derby.log and metastore db directory for our examples at least. Um, um, so we, we've spent a lot of time in the REPL uh, from the Scala session, so the fact that Spark Shell has this REPL uh, is, is, we've already sort of covered that. PySpark also will open up a Python shell or a Python REPL and you can do um, the same thing. So it, if you want to, we've been, we've been starting with Spark Shell. If you want to start a Python uh, instance, you just do the same thing, Spark Home slash bin PySpark, and then that'll open up uh, a Py, PySpark shell. And it will pick up the version of Python that is natively installed on your mach machine. <coughs> so if you've installed Python 3, some of these examples won't work exactly because Py Python, Python 3 and Python 2 are um, a little different. And uh, so just to, be, just to be aware of that one. Um, but also, the Spark context should be available when you when you bring that when you bring the PySpark shell up. So you just type SC and it'll it'll return a, a little object uh, pointer. So just want to talk a little bit about the basic abstraction in Spark, which is the resilient distributed data set. And we've been we've been covering this idea. Um, a little bit throughout the talk, but um, what it is really is it's a fault tolerant collection. So a collection is a big list of um, items, and RDD is a parallel, parallelized form of that. So you just you know if you you have a terabyte uh, terabytes uh, worth of numbers. Um, you're gonna do something called SC dot parallelize. You can think of it that way. You create a very large list, maybe an iterator or something like that, so you don't use up too much memory when you do it. And then you say SC dot parallelize that list, and then it'll take that list and it'll put it on the put it on the cluster. Um, it can be operated on in parallel, so that means you can have each node work on a piece of it. It'll divide it up into partitions. And those partitions can each be operated on by, by the executor. Um, and it's immutable once you construct it. So in Scala, things are already immutable. So you're already kind of used to the idea of immutability. But in R, uh, an RDD, is, is, is the, you don't have the option of defining it as a variable. It's always immutable. Um, and, and it has to be because now you're always operating in parallel. So the three ways you can create an RDD 
is, as I said, you know, take, take an existing collection and then just say sc.parallelize and then that will create a, <coughs> a parallel collection. And, um, or you can load uh, a, a file that's sitting on Hadoop. It's a parallel file already, so you just load it and it goes directly into uh, to an RDD. Um, or you can transform an existing RDD. So we'll talk a little bit about transformations uh, in, in, in a moment, but a transformation <coughs> on an RDD always returns an RDD. So one example of a transformation is a map. So you add one to every element of that, um, of that RDD. You say map x uh, forward arrow equals x plus one. And that will, um, that will create another RDD with <coughs> not the values, but the instructions to carry out that operation. And we'll talk a little bit about why that's important. But, but the, the main thing to, to remember is that, is that when you do these kinds of operations on an RDD, it'll create another uh, RDD. So it's just like parallel abstraction. Um, and uh, these are all the files that are supported currently, and there are many other ones. Um, ORC is one that gets used a lot too, but uh, there are lots and lots of file formats for these. So, um, um, I need to grab a glass of water again. Sorry, excuse me. Okay. Um, excuse me for that. Um, so, so the idea of a of a transformation is really is 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 not to actually carry out the calculation, but to <coughs> to issue an instruction to carry out that calculation. So you say, I've got a very large list of numbers. I want to add one to each of those lists, uh, each each element of that list. But then I want to filter that list based on some criterion. So let's say I want to add one to each one, but then I want to take the ones that are only greater than ten or something like that. Th you can imagine that there is some clever way of understanding the best way to carry out that operation if you know both are happening, right? You know that you're adding one and then you're filtering because you don't need to add one to the ones that are going to be filtered, right? So um, there's this notion of lazy evaluation that's built into transformations. This is why when you do a transformation, you return another RDD because it's this, it's this, parallel, it's this parallel abstraction that, that you're not necessarily carrying actions out on. So you can instantly define you know, your, your RDD and then add one to it and then do some other operations. You can, all of those happen very, very fast. And then you do something like an action which, ha which really tells it, oh, now I got to do the calculation, right? Now I, okay, now count, count the elements in the array. How many, how many elements actually met the filter criterion? And that will initiate the actual calculation. That will actually send the, uh, the job requests out and it'll start to carry out the operations. And those operations will be a whole series of transformations that were applied to, to the RDD. So, um, so you think your code is running really fast, and then you hit an action, and then you're like, "Oh, okay, now I, you know." Um, so, so, so when you're when you're coding this stuff, always keep keep in mind. So, an action, the, the way to remember it too is an action always returns a local object, because then what it's doing is it's carrying out some kind of calculation and returning returning the object to the driver so that you can actually you know see what the value is and things like that. And so this whole RDD really is, uh, has this whole series of operations and it's called the DAG. When you see the debug logs and everything like that, it'll have, um, it'll, 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 um, it'll, it'll, you'll see DAG show up a lot in the debug. Um, and so, so this DAG is really the key to the resilience, right? So what happens is, you know, if, if you lose your node, it actually, it still has that DAG which said, Oh, I was supposed to load it, then add one to it, then filter, then do this, and then, and then count, and all that. And, and, and that's how I can have this fault tolerance, because it has a whole series of instructions uh, stored already, so it can, it can recover in that way. So that's, that's the RDD. That's the Resilient Distributed Data Set. So that's the, um, that is one of the uh, really fundamental ideas uh, in, in, in Spark. And so here are some of the basic transformations, map, filter, 
this thing called flat map, which is like takes an array of arrays and treats it as a single long list. So, for example, if you're reading a line of uh, a line of words, the first line has a list of words, the second line ha has another list of words. So that's a list of lists, but you actually want to just treat it like one big list. So um, that's what you use flat map for. Um, actions. So reduce is an action because it returns. Uh, it takes a very large list of numbers and returns uh, returns a sum, right? If you're if you're uh, adding numbers, take will take the first few elements of the list. Collect is the one that you have to be careful with. You can it works great when you know you're developing on laptop scale, but then if you do collect on a a few terabytes of data sitting out on your cluster, then all that data goes to your driver node and will crash the driver node. So it's, uh, so, so take is usually what you use to, as sort of a debug. So you can just take, take a peek at the first few elements of the array. Um, and take order, there's some other ones that, you know, uh, various flavors of, uh, of take. So um, we'll go into the first demo here. See if we can get PySpark working. Okay, um, I just wanted to uh, we'll, do, we'll 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 do the first one in 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 PySpark. Um, I think this is my one and only Python demo. Um, part part of <clears throat> Part of the motivation for putting the Python demo is to show how very similar Python and Scala are. So um, they're pretty pretty much the same things with just a few minor changes. And um, so so um, and in fact, what's really nice about the docs, if you get a chance to uh, let's see. What's really nice about the docs is it'll have tabs of, of, of a Scala, a Python, and a Java version of the same code. So I verified that my Spark context was created. What this is saying here is that <coughs> the Spark context is the master is local, which means it's not running in cluster mode. It's running in local mode. And the star means it's running with all the threads that it can get. So however many threads are on uh, max, so 16 threads or whatever. And, um, and then uh, it'll assign a PySpark shell name to, that, to the app. And um, the other thing is kind of hand, handy. How many people have Python 3 on their machine? Python 3. Python 3 has auto tab or tab complete built into the shell. Python 2 doesn't. So you, know, you always do this read line RL completer trick. Um, so you can see what all the methods are. Um, it's pretty handy because if, when you're creating these RDDs, sometimes you don't know. It, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of methods to keep track of, so it's nice to have them available uh, to you. So, um, and then I don't remember all this stuff in, uh, in Python 3. There's something like this to get to, to, to run. Uh, So what we did there is we created data, which is a, um, and I think you can actually, yeah, you can. So you can actually get the type of the variable in Python by doing type, which can be pretty handy because the thing, the thing about Spark is that you have an array, which is a local object, or any collection, which is a local object, and then you have something that's pretty much identical to it, that it's a parallel object, which is this RDD. So knowing Knowing whether it's an RDD or an array is, uh, is can be a challenge sometimes if you're if you're if you're not keeping track of the types, and especially in Python because it's not statically typed. Um, so so all we did here is we created this RDD and notice when you're in Python, you all, I've seen this in other cases too. You're almost doing the typing in your variable naming, right? Now we're saying. Uh, we're saying, oh, here's data, and then, uh, and then, but, but we're going to create an RDD, so maybe I'll put RDD in the name because I don't, 
I might lose track of the type. So you're actually kind of typing it while you're, while you're, while you're writing. And um, so, um, so now you've got X range RDD. And, and I think you can, yeah. Yeah, so now it says, oh, this is, a, this, is this RDD type here if you wanted to uh, figure out what the type was. Now, the only way you can get to that variable, to the, to the contents of that, is either by doing, is by doing, you can't, you can't see what's happening in it as a RDD because it's this cluster abstraction. So you have to do collect um, or count or take or one of those actions to actually get to the contents of it. And so that's, that's, what, that's what was sitting on the cluster, that, 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 that list of numbers. Um, then you can do a you can do a, a lambda expression just like you could uh, you can in Scala except for it has a slightly different syntax. It's this lambda x colon x uh, x equals x minus one. So um, and then it's got filter uh, and uh, and uh, all all the the same type of uh, lambda operations that you would see in Scala. So the um, and, and so this is what it looks like in Scala, right? And and now that Sometimes I, when I'm doing the Spark class, I don't always do the Scala primer at the beginning. So, but but now we're all Scala pros, so we can see we, we're we can see what you know, we can see that this is all this all looks pretty much like the collection operations, right? I mean, there's not much difference. But the thing to remember is that this is these are these are operations on RDDs. So these are Spark, these these are, these are collections that are created by the Spark framework um, that do pretty much the same thing. But if you look. Um, so uh, filtered RDD. And now, let's see. So these are the things that you can do with test, which is a uh, list here, right? And these are the things that you can do with RDD, um, or filtered RDD was what I collected, right? So it's got all this other stuff, all this, all this uh, Spark stuff: first, distinct, count, collect, um, and some other, some other, some other stuff. So. Um, so yeah, definitely, definitely uh, the the autocomplete will will help help you get a feel for all this stuff. Uh, so how are we doing for time? Three fifteen. Okay. So try to first demo in Scala. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about what we just did with with those RDDs. Um, when we cre when we when we when we said, hey, this is a parallel object. It, it broke up that data set into partitions, and you can assign the number of partitions, or you let uh, you let Spark figure out what the best way to partition it is. Um, but then it'll take those, you know, and then then each uh, each executor gets a gets a gets to work on a piece of that. Um, then what we did is we did a map operation. We said subtract one, and so each executor crunched through that, you know, in parallel. And stored the result on the executor. So, so this is all happening pretty much at the same time. There's a little bit of um, asynchrony, but but uh, but they're all completely independent operations. So, so it can it, it's um, not a concern. So now, then the filter operation just says, oh, just bring me the ones that 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 satisfy that result. There are other things that you can do. Um, uh, collect would would and, and we mentioned this before would take all the results and send it back to the driver and of course that can <coughs> po possibly cause cause issues um, and this one is a count and so this starts to speak to how spark handles these counting operations reduce operations there's other clever ways all this stuff is happening so this is 
what I had mentioned about these sort of uh, the notion of an iterable, you say you, you, you just you, you send it a method and you let it figure out how to how to how how the best uh, how to do it uh, in in the way that's most efficient, and and so what it does is it just goes to each executor says oh add those numbers up and then store those results and then and then I'll just take those sums of those and it does that for a lot of these types of operations where it's sort of does these node local operations and then sends the uh, summarized result as needed. Um, so there are, there's a notion of, uh, of, of, of persistence. And uh, I think I might actually show you that, um, an example of that one. Um, so what you can do is you can persist your data on the cluster mostly in memory. So You've got your you've got your data. You load it, and you you want to access that same data set multiple times very very rapidly. And so what you do is you say, okay, store that in memory. And then there's other options here. If it spills over, it can go uh, into disk. It can go uh, in a serialized form or, or deserialized form, and various things. And so what this a lot of times you don't necessarily especially if you're using the methods in a, in a high level, you may not need to do this kind of engineering, but you may, I mean, it, it may come up. But I mean, let's say you're just calling a machine learning algorithm. All the caching and stuff like that is handled already by the machine learning algorithm. If you're doing a data frames operation, a lot of the caching is already handled. But let's say you're cooking up your own RDD operation that, that really you have to write at a low level, then you may be doing memory management um, on it. The other thing to, to note is that there really is a lot of time, you know, the, the ratio between memory on your cluster and memory on disk is usually pretty small. So if you're, if you're going into an application thinking that you're going to get leverage from a, let's say you have a data set that you're querying all day long and you want to just cache it and just have rapid access to it. Uh, you need to have enough memory on your cluster to store it in memory. Otherwise, you're swapping out memory and spilling the disk and things like that, and you're losing all of the optimizations that you you think you may be getting. So make sure you spec out your cluster so that your data set will fit in memory if that is your intent. Um, so um, and there's a, there's a quick way I can show you a quick way to do that. Um, so let's uh, use simple cache. And uh, and then I'll show you a little bit of the um, I'll show you a little bit of the uh, Spark UI too. Um, and I will do Spark Shell. So I'm not going to get that much of a bump by. Um, by caching the data for this example, we'll get a little bit of one, but um, but 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 not really. Um, but you'll see a little bit of it in action. So what are we doing here? We're we're create we're we're parallelizing this uh, this range into 50 partitions, and then we're caching it. <clears throat> the thing to remember is that caching is a um, is not an action; it's a transformation. So you have to actually you actually have to actually carry out an action to initialize that whole load process. So load is even not an action. Load is a transformation. So when you load the data or create the RDD, it still, it still hasn't done the calculation that is associated with that. So you have, to initial, you have to do something like count in order to get it to go through that whole series of operations. So when you do count, then it will cache the data. And, uh, and then the second time you ca count it, it should count faster after it's already been put on the cluster, right? So um, let's see if that if that works out. So again, to to uh, to run scripts, uh, I don't know if we covered this in the Scala examples because we were doing cut and paste. You do uh, colon load, and then simple cache. Okay, so the first time, the first time we counted it, it took 0.88 seconds. Uh, the second time, it took I don't know 
one fourth the time. And so that can, that can be up to 10x, that can be up to a 10x difference, maybe even larger in some cases, depending on how you design your system. But you gotta, you have to design, make sure you have, um, you know, thoughtful design in, in, in place when you're doing it. But let me just open up the Spark UI because it's fun to look at. And uh, so let's see, I think it's here. And then, so it's uh, localhost 4040 maybe, let's see. Maybe it's 4041. Hmm. So the default part for uh, the Spark UI is 4040. If you've got a Spark instance running, it'll look for 4041, and then just keep keep going till you get. So I've got a bunch of uh, I've got a bunch of latent. Uh, so here's um, so first. Let's look at the job. There was a first count. Uh, the first one took 0.6 seconds, and then it says that the second one took uh, 45 milliseconds. So I'm not sure exactly uh, where the extra latency in our timing comes from, but um, but uh, but even here you can see that there's a difference. I mean, this is a significant difference in uh, in the count time. The other thing is you can take a look at the stages. Um, each count was a stage. The tasks were broken up into 50 tasks because there were 50 partitions. Um, we cached it. So now it'll tell you, this is the part where you can really trouble, make sure your cluster is up to the job of, of the caching that, you're, that you need to do. Is it's got a storage thing and it says, oh, I've got 50 partitions. It's 100% cached. Um, that way, that, and that's, that's what you want. And this will tell you how much size is in memory. Then you can start to, 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 to to, to size out your uh, cluster. Um, this is your environment. This tells you all of the settings. Um, for example, the Spark Master was local star, and then it has you know the Java, a, a bunch of other stuff that, that will definitely come in handy for you. The scheduler mode, for example. Um, the executors, here in this case, we only have one executor, which happens to also be the driver. So that's the whole, because we're running on our laptop. But here, this will list out all of those executors that I was telling you about, the worker nodes. And it'll tell you the IP address. It'll tell you, you know, how, how they're performing, um, all the tasks that they're carrying out, and things like that. Um, and then if you, I, I think I actually do have a data frames example, so we can show you how the SQL um, is working. So. Um, um, so that's just a quick, uh, quick overview of the uh, Spark UI. Um, okay, so we've got, um, we're looking at about 40 minutes to cover some of the libraries. In general, I don't get through all of them. <laughs> um, so uh, you guys can kind of, uh, you know, the ones I really like to cover are, are data frames, um, and MLlib, and uh, and then after that, there's GraphX, uh, Spark Streaming, and uh, SystemML, R4ML, and some of the other ones. Um, so as I start to get closer to the end, maybe we can discuss about which ones you guys want to hear hear about the most. You, all of these work uh, pretty much out of the box. So if we don't get through all of them, you just you, you just do uh, that load. Uh, file command and then just run through the examples and uh, everything everything should work uh, as expected. If they don't, please feel free to give me a call. Um, so um, let's talk a little bit about uh, Spark SQL. Um, this is um, this is the module that takes your RDD and turns it into something called the data frame. That data frame looks like a table in SQL. So then you can do you can run SQL commands on those tables. You can join those tables with other tables. Do all the things that you can do with uh, database. 
a regular database. It is almost completely ANSI compliant, which, which means you can do you know, nested joins and windowing functions and all the fancy stuff. Um, but it, it, you, know, it, you can also just do your basic SQL workloads, which is sort of what I prefer just to make it <coughs> legible. But, um, but, but it's, it's a pretty robust uh, uh, SQL engine at this point. So, um, and let's see, wait, let me make sure I covered the, yeah, so, so yeah, the main, the main abstraction here is this thing called the data frame, which is just a generalized version of an RDD. It's an RDD with some additional metadata that allows you to treat it like a table. And it's a collection of rows, and those rows each have, you know, column elements and things like that. So we'll, we'll show you what it looks like um, in practice. That, that'll, that'll be a little bit more helpful. Okay, so we're here, and let's do data frames. Okay. So um, we're gonna we're gonna load this um, very large data file with uh, three records in it, and we're gonna do some SQL on that. So um, I'll just go ahead and uh, let's uh, let's cut and paste it. Why not? Let's. So the first thing it's doing is it's got this it's got this JSON reader. So it's this spark.read.json, which just allows it to read JSON format. Again, pretty much all file formats are supported. I'm not sure if CSV is. It didn't used to be. There, you had to load a library for CSV readers, but for the most part, you know, most formats are supported. Um, you know, when you're working with the larger data sets, it's preferred to use the compressed formats. But for this debug, we can do the JSON format. Um, and uh, so now you've got a, a data frame. You know, you can do things that you're sort of used to doing with, with uh, data. You can show and print, print schema. Um, and uh, there, there's a bunch of other standard operations. And then the, the trick is to do this thing where you create this temp view. Just so how many people are SQL? like writing in SQL, prefer writing in SQL. Okay, so um, I, I do, for certain workloads, it, it's really great. It's, um, you, can, you, can, you can really do a lot with it. And um, the, um, so, so you create this temp view, and then you name your table. And now if you just wanna run, um, so there's a few ways to do it. This is sort of the more, um, you know, the, the more, method-based way of doing it. You're just saying df.select. You know, it's got a df.group by, it's got a, all these kind of SQL-like uh, operations that you can call as a method. Um, but then you can just write SQL too. So once you've assigned your table here, this people table, then you just say select name from people. And then it will, um, and then it will do your uh, SQL operations. So let's take a look at what that, this one does. Um, So it created a, it created a, let's, uh, oh. So, oh, oh, I gotta do this. Um, df2.show. Okay, and so, so just what it does is it, it I, I, I defined it here just so you could see that it creates another data frame from this operation. So this operation resulted in, 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 in creating a new, a new data frame object. So you, you, these, the output of a query is, is, is another data frame. Um, another data frame that may, or ha may have different columns, may have different data types. You know, it's not completely strongly typed, um, but it, it, has, uh, it, it has the data frame uh, type. So um, you can do other things. You can do filter. Um, there's a few ways, I mean, if you're like an R programmer, this dollar sign notation, I think, is 
you see this a lot. So it supports a few different ways of um, doing SQL. I still prefer the actual SQL. It seems to be a little more readable. Um, but, but you can do you know, counts and group buys. And th this, can be, this can be very handy for, for lots of workloads. It's also, uh, you, you do see a lot of cases where you actually have a workload that's already written in SQL using some other database. And you can just translate those SQL statements directly into Spark. So it does make some migration issues very, very easy. Um, but it's great. And, and the, um, it, if you can do stuff in data frames, it's really strongly urged that you do because um, it leverages something called the Catalyst Optimization Engine. So there's all kinds of these optimizations that are built into um, these, uh, these SQL queries because so much is known about how to optimize SQL queries. Um, and a lot of that expertise is built into this. It's also, if you're writing in Python, it's also much, much faster to use the data frames operations because what it does is it compiles this instruction set into Java bytecode that's identical to the Java byte code that would result from the Scala code. So it is the one library where you get identical, virtually identical performance in both APIs. So, um, so, so it's, it's, it's definitely worthwhile if, if you're committed to uh, PySpark um, uh, workflow uh, to, try, to try to write it in data frames if you can. Um, so, Okay, so um, any questions on data frames or, okay. The um, MLlib is, is really the whole reason Spark came into being. Um, it was a, it, it, it's, the, it's Spark's machine learning library. And the goal was to make, make machine learning scalable, easy, um, and, and performant, frankly. It, there were, at the time, n it was really difficult to get machine learning to perform well at scale. Um, and so it has lots of optimization primitives and high, higher level APIs. Um, it's got two packages which can be very confusing and I am still a bit puzzled by a lot of this. But um, the original one was MLlib and then later on, they came up with another library called .ml, machine, machine learning libel. And what, really what the big difference is, is that ML leverages the data sets API, which is a newer, a newer API that uses this Catalyst engine, whereas Spark ML Lib uses the RDD API. Um, and so the result is that ML is supposed to be uh, a better performing library, that's not necessarily true as of yet. There's, there's pieces where MLlib is actually still preferred, so you gotta do a little back and forth to try and figure out which one. You can't, you can't go wrong, either one will produce good results. It's just, you might wanna fiddle with, uh, you might wanna fiddle with both libraries to make sure you get the right performance levels. And uh, we don't talk too much about pipelines, but pipelines are you know, this more generalized abstraction about how to transform your data set and you can do hyperparameter searches and lots of, uh, lots of, lots of documentation to go through um, uh, on, the, on the website and really probably could spend a few days talking about MLlib um, and to, to cover it in sufficient detail. Um, but, but definitely wanna get it to where you can load it you know, get it working, get it running on your laptop and, and feel comfortable running the examples. Um, so I'll show you what a k-means demo looks like. How many people are familiar with uh, k-means algorithm? Okay. Okay, so uh, I'll talk a little bit about k-means, what, what k-means algorithm is. Um, so I think we are in, yeah, we're in, and this is gonna load, where is it? K-means data. Okay. Uh, 
PySpark. So we're loading up PySpark here. Um, and what we're going to do is cluster these data points. So this is a XYZ coordinates. Uh, or you can think of them as a, a list of coordinates. They happen to be the same XYZ coordinates. So this is uh, you know X equals 0, Y equals 0, Z equals 0. Second one is X equals 0 0.1. And if you look at it, it looks if you were to plot this on a 3D um, uh, plot, you would say, oh, I bet you these points would cluster around that center point 0 0.1, right? Because they're kind of close. And then if you look at the second one, you say, oh, yeah, that would probably cluster around this 9.1 uh, data set. So that's basically what clustering is. is it it's, uh, takes usually Euclidean distance between uh, points. Um, you can think of these as being, you know, a three-dimensional vector, it can be extended to an n-dimensional vector. And it takes the Euclidean distance between those points and it, it finds the ones that are closest uh, to, the, uh, to the center of that mean and then just updates it iteratively. So it creates, it's what's known as an unsupervised learning algorithm, which means it, it just kind of looks for natural structure in the data. So it doesn't have any labels assigned to it, it just says, oh, I think there's a cluster of stuff here, maybe that's important, uh, and there's a cluster of stuff here. And so the big, the big workhorse for unsupervised learning in Spark is, is, is k-means. I think there are others. In fact, the topic modeling one that we're covering uh, next is, a, is also unsupervised. But, um, OK, so um, k-means. I really, I just I kind of wanted to get you used to finding, you know, you can find you can find snippets of code in the docs. You can find snippets of code on Stack Overflow. Cut and paste, run them, see, see if you can reproduce the results. And that is, you spend a lot of time doing just that. Just finding, you know, a lot of times it's just getting the right combination of API calls and, you know, uh, everything working because the libraries are already there. Everything is working. It's just a matter of, you know, ho ho hooking up the wires correctly and interpreting the results. So, um, So let's see. So, um, so this one, I think, center is will tell you the names of the clusters. Uh, oh no! How about clusters? Uh, centers. Okay. So this this one this there's all kinds of stuff that are that are there. It tells you the centers. It tells you K. We define k to be two, so the k in k means is how many how many clusters you you want to assign to it. Um, and so the centers are here, and then each member of those um, clusters uh, is in there somewhere. I can't remember where to access it, but so now it well what, what's nice is that it found the centroids that we kind of expected here, right? It we. We saw that the data was clustering around those two points, and, and, it, and it turned out that it was. So, so, so th those are the kinds of things that you can do with, um, with these basic algorithms. And I think this one came out of the docs. So a lot of this stuff is just they're in cells. You copy it directly out, run it, see if it, see if it makes sense. And um, the next one is uh, topic modeling. And this, is, uh, this one's done in, in um, in the data science experience, you can run this on. You can run this code on your, you know, from your laptop. The only reason I brought I put it in data science experience is because it has, um, it has Brunel, installed, um, and uh, that's kind of cool to do some plotting. So, um, you, so this one is. Um, let's see. So this one's got two elements to it. Um, this one has a training. Let's see. First, let's get the. We're going to. I'm going to restart. Let's see. Actually, let's see if it's. 
I just want to check and see if it's uh, still running. It, it, oh, this one might, we might be, uh, might be out of luck on this one. Um, that's some caching issues on that one. So I want to, I want to review, um, I want to review what's happening with latent Dirichlet allocation. So latent uh, Dirichlet allocation is a method for modeling topics. So it's an unstructured learning or uh, unsupervised learning algorithm. And what it does is it takes a, a body of articles and clusters them into topics. And it says a probability. Um, and then so it'll, it'll have, let's say you specify 10 topics. It'll say each one of those topics emits words and the probability of uh, the there's uh, there's a there's an article that has a fraction of words that were emitted from each topic so the by by assigning these probabilities you can say oh it's probably got 10 percent from uh from a topic about uh you know trump and then another 10 percent uh, as from putin and you know various topics but it's a mixture of uh, it's a mixture of topics that go into each um, go into each uh, each model. So so I'll show you. It'll it'll make more sense when uh, slow kernel connection. Oh no. Um, let's see. Maybe this will. I think I have a cached version of this that I can I can show you as well. While we're looking at that, yes, I do. So I'm just going to walk you through the training of the model first. Can you guys see this OK? Um, so this is basically a, a notebook. Um, you you can run you can run Spark and uh, Jupyter Notebook on your laptop if you want to try to install it yourself. Uh, I think you can run DSX Local on your machine if you want to try it there. Um, Jupyter's uh, uh, fully open source and DSX is built on Jupyter. So um, if you ever migrate if you want to migrate back and forth between the two, it's a pretty transparent thing to do. Um, to get Scala running in Jupyter, it's called the Tori kernel. And uh, that, that can be installed from the GitHub. But if you guys have any questions about any of that, just let me know, and I can uh, be happy to point you to all of that. What this is doing now here is it's, it's loading the Yahoo News Group's data set. Is this one working? Yes. OK. And then how about this one? Still a slow kernel. Okay, so let's. That's okay. We'll 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 look at this cached one. Um, so it's going to load the data set, which it looks like this. Um, this data set is uh, the the Yahoo twenty thousand uh, articles that are pre-categorized into twenty different. Um, directories here. So each directory contains a thousand news articles and they've already gone through and curated and say, well, we think these are all about atheism, we think these are all about graphics, etc. So we're gonna what we're gonna do is we're gonna model those topics with no prior knowledge of the, the topics that were assigned. So it will we're we're hoping that we'll naturally coalesce into uh, into topics that are similar to those that were assigned. Um, and so this is first thing you need to do is create a vocabulary array. This means the counts the number of times a certain word occurs. This is, I was saying, one of those uh, word count uh, challenges. This is definitely something that's a, a large uh, data issue. Um, here we're actually loading some uh, data. And oh, wait a minute. Let's see. Um, so we're back here. This is just all of the boilerplate that goes into um, creating. You're going to create the corpus, and then based on the corpus, you're going to um, you're going to train the model here. 
So basically, there's a lot of boilerplate that gets into um, you create this sort of documents object, and then you uh, create this LDA object with all the topics, and then you say uh, train the model, and that's and that's basically it. So a lot of these machine learning, uh, it's got ETL, it's got and, and then it's got um, some kind of training uh, operation that usually takes a very very long time. The output of that will be a model, and then the model will be applied to new data. Right, so 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 that's that's usually the way that these uh, machine learning workflows go, and they're much more formalized in the ML pipelines, but but that's the basic idea. So so we so we ran it, uh, we created a model, and now what I did here is I say is I had two notebooks, I say I ran the model on one notebook because that's a time intensive part, and then I and then I had another notebook that loads the model. And so you'll see that in practice as well. So you'll, you'll have some batch operation that trains your model periodically, and then you deploy it somehow to some other, maybe Spark application or maybe some other uh, service layer. And um, so then what we've done here is we loaded that very same model that we wrote and uh, also loaded the vocabulary. These are the topics that it came up with. Um, the first, uh, so it gives you topic one. These are the, the, the words with the scores. Um, and it's kind of hard to read. There's a lot of stuff to go through. So we do this, um, this Wordle or text cloud. And this, will, um, this gives you a little bit of a feel for what the contents are. Um, and I can't remember. Oh yeah, this one. We we I think we thought it had a lot of it had a lot of electrical and it had a lot of scientific terms in it. So if we look back up here, this is the unstructured part, right? So it said it just gives you a which one was it? I think we said sci sci dot electronics. We looked at that topic cloud and said that looks. And this is how this is kind of what unsupervised learning gives you. It gives you just a, some cluster of results, and you begin to assign labels yourself. So we're saying, okay, that looks like scientific electronics. Um, now we can show these with the weights, and this has you know conductors, Mathematica. It looks you know um, like that. And then so we load the first our article in the electronics directory, and we say, okay, so um, this is just the first email. I don't know, it, it has a bunch of stuff and a uh, transmission to a reliable underwater. That looks, that sounds scientific and electronic. Um, uh, wireless communications, antennas, okay, that seems like that might be a, a topic. So, so we take that article and we say, what, what is the topic distribution for that article? And, 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 and now it should return something and hopefully it will identify the topic that we uh, believed is the correct topic, and it turns out that the topic was um, was topic six was the one that we identified as scientific electronics. That one seems to be the one that's most prevalent in that. So, it's the beginnings of a uh, of assigning uh, topics to incoming uh, items. So, um, of course, this is just very preliminary, right? We're just starting to get out of the unsupervised uh, clustering study, so. Um, but 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 that's that's sort of how you might use those. So um, the um, I do want to cover the library. Somebody was asking about um, you know H two O and some of the other um, linear algebra packages out there. So IBM has an open source version of that. Uh, an open source library that that handles mathematical operations and algorithmic development um, type operations. So uh, it's a it's a very compact language. This is a completely open source package. Um, it's top level uh, Apache project, and it's got some great developers uh, that have been working on it for many years. And we really like to see people adopt it. Um, and so um, let us know if you're interested in it. We'll be glad to help you. Uh, get going on this, but the um, a system ML project really is, is this thing called declarative machine learning, and 
what, what it does, it runs on top of Spark, so it calls the Spark runtime, but it is just a very compact way of writing certain mathematical operations. Think of it as like SQL for math algorithms, just very compact and very, you know, uh, very good for certain types of, uh, of, of workloads. And so anything that has matrix uh, operations, it's, it's really great for it. It's got lots of optimizations on the back end on how to, how to do these distributed matrix multiplies. You can also do things like, this is a conjugate gradient descent. I don't know if anybody went to the talk yesterday where we were talking about optimizers um, for the neural nets. Uh, sure, so, so this would be one of those algorithms for solving, uh, uh, you know, for the weights of a neural net. It would be a, one of these optimizers. And these can, you know, these can be hundreds of lines in, if you try, even if you try to write in Scala or, or Java or some, you know, uh, some, some language. So, so for this particular mathematical notation, it's very, very good for uh, writing, writing this kind of um, algorithms. Um, so um, if you want to get started with this, uh, let me know. Basically, all you have to do is go to this. Um, you can't see that at all, can you? Let's see. Um, It, if you if you if you want to try to get going with it, the, there's two examples. Um, you can go to the download site, and it's uh, it's this binary here, um, and you unzip to the location, and then there's a jar um, that's in there, um, and that is in the systemml uh, 0.140 directory, and then at the command line, the this is just kind of a nice thing to know about running Spark shells. If, if there's any library that you want to run uh, manually, there's, there's a variety of ways to do it, but you could just download the jar and then just do dash dash jars, and then it'll bring in your library, and then you can import all of the uh, features of the library. Um, so uh, I'll quickly, um, actually, I will, um, in the interest of time, since we are in five minutes, I will um, just walk you through the code so you see what it looks like. Um, but the idea here is um, you create, you do some imports, you create this, this uh, creature called the ML context, very much like the Spark context, but now it just you know, has all the ML, uh, system ML stuff built into it. Um, and then this, it just tells you versions and things like that. So this is, this is kind of how you do it in Spark. You, you, you write a string, and the string is your DML code, your system ML code. And so this one just says, you know, create this random matrix, um, and uh, create this random matrix, do a sum, and then return the output, right? So this is this little snippet of code. You embed the snip, snippet of code in your uh, Spark code, and then, and then you, and then you just say ML execute script, and it'll and it'll run the uh, it'll it'll run the it'll run the system ML. So so it's it's really great for certain kinds of things, especially if you're developing your own algorithms, and um, it literally can condense you know hundreds of lines into uh, you know ten to fifty lines of code. There's a huge collection of uh, algorithms that are available, and um, so this one will also allow you to, um, oh yeah, this one will allow you, so you, if you don't want to embed that big string into the code, you can uh, load it from a, you can load the DML from a file. And the GitHub has somewhere on the order of 50 algorithms. So what we, what the, the intention of the system ML project was to release machine learning algorithms that were complementary to the, the ML lib. So we have a lot of algorithms that aren't present in the, uh, in the Spark ML lib uh, libraries. So a lot of really specialized algorithms, some time series stuff in there. Um, it's, it's really great. Um, so ch check it out if you can. Um, and uh, let us know if you have any questions on that one. Um, this has got a k-means example. I think we're going to skip that one. Um, I was thinking I was going to cover the, I've got five minutes left, maybe go through the graphics demos. Um, and then if you guys are still interested afterwards, I think uh, I can, you know, I can, we can take it offline. I can show you some of the other Spark streaming and R4ML ones. 
Um, does that sound good? You guys want to see GraphX for the last example before we sort of officially wrap up at four? And uh, um, okay, so GraphX is a is a graph processing library. Um, so it's just it's got APIs for running graph parallel uh, operations. Um, it's got things like you know pull out a subgraph for all the edges that meet a certain requirement. Um, it's got a lot of common algorithms. PageRank is the main one uh, that's available. Um, it's also got this great API called Graph Frames, which is kind of this um, other additional layer on top of lets you do SQL on your graphs and pass it back and forth between data frames. And it has some other really cool pre-indexing uh, operations. And it's got it's a it's a really it's a really neat library. Um, and the um, so, so here's the idea, it's basically a, a, an RDD the vertices and edges. So each, every, every vertex has got, has got a single value, but then every edge is you know, connecting certain vertices. And so those can be represented as collections, and those collections can be par parallelized. And then there's some additional bookkeeping that allows it to be uh, treated li like a graph. But creating it is really a, a matter of just uh, taking all these nodes and edges and and uh, making RDDs out of them. Um, it has a great view called the triplets view, which, which will print out you know, pretty much all the information you need to know. It'll tell you, tell you all of the edges and then all of the values between all of the edges. So that's the one that you, you know, when you're debugging, you tend to, to use the most. Um, so we'll just do a quick uh, simple graph uh, demo. And Simple graph, yeah, we'll do that here. So, let's see if I can, I don't know if I can do this in two minutes, but I'll try to. What's a typical use case where you might want to do a graph analysis? Hmm, that's a, that's a good uh, question. So it's usually, you know, um, connecting, connecting the dots between, so it's always like, uh, I'm friends with you and you're friends with her, um, but they don't know that her and I may have, you know, me, me and her might be friends because we, we share you in common, right? That is actually kind of hard to do at scale with any other kind of data structure. So um, it's usually that, it's that, that, that complex chain of connections um, that, that graphs can work out. Um, the other thing is like distances, you know, if you traverse a, a map, uh, the uh, you can find the shortest path through 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 uh, through a graph using special algorithms that work on graphs. Um, but yeah, that's the one. Uh, this one here is you know supply chains, for example. So where where did a particular uh, product come from? All the pieces that go into building it. We'll uh, try to trace that. Um, this one here, we're doing a. Um, I have one where it's a click stream um, uh, example. See, I'm going to um, and uh, so yeah, maybe I'll. Uh, in fact, just in the interest of time, I'll walk you very quickly through the simple graph one, and then I'll sh I'll show you the graph demos, and then I'll show you the output of that one. So then uh, we I won't keep you here um, over time, but uh, let me let me show you the simple graph demo, and then. Uh, So again, you know, uh, feel free to run these uh, at home and uh, let me know if you're you're able to get them working. Okay, so this is this triplets view I was telling you about. Um, so basically, we've got this. We created this users. Um, we created this users array. Did it again. To work on that. Okay. 
So we created this users array here, uh, on which uh, created the users array here, um, which has got two, two fields. Um, so you can have two different uh, descriptors. Um, these are stored in tuples, and then the, they have a, 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 a long uh, integer uh, identifying the nodes. And then you have relationships. So now three is connected to seven as a collaborator, right? So that's the edge with the, with the value. So you know, this can be a floating point. This can be a string. This can be um, a variety of things. Um, and then we have this default user. Um, which is John Doe if there is a uh, if there's a missing connection and so um, so Peter is the student of John Doe which means that Peter didn't have uh, a proper edge set up so let's see if we can figure out where that is uh, Peter Right, so Peter, uh, Peter is a student. He's node four. Uh, four has an edge of four connected to zero, but actually zero doesn't isn't present in the vertex list, right? So that's what this um, this default user says. Oh, if it's, if the node's not there, then assign a missing value to it. And so the missing value is John Doe. So it does a little bit of extra bookkeeping for you once you create the graph and make sure everything is connected it the way you, you would expect it. Um, and then you can create this triplet, um, this triplet view, which, um, which let's just show you really quick. So triplets is a, returns an RDD. So you have to collect it to see what it is. And uh, it's just an array of, uh, of nodes um, and, and who they're connected to. So three is connected to seven and, and has all the information. So it's kind of hard to read here, but it actually has all the information you need built into it to do all the graph traversals that you, if you want to write your own algorithms to do traversals, it's all in the triplets structure. So um, I, got, I got two minutes to show you um, the graph. Um, but I, I will probably just show you, so load click stream. So what we did here, um, I, I think what I'll, what I'll do is just describe it to you rather than go through the code because this is um, a lot of code. But what we did is we said we loaded the click stream data set um, from Wikipedia. And that just, mean, that just says that, okay, I'm on, uh, for example, we said uh, Watson. Uh, Watson computer was a center node. It says, okay. And then it says, what the click stream data was says, oh, if you're on Watson, you had 100 clicks to IBM. And you had another, and then from IBM, you had another 10 clicks to this, that, and the other. So what we did is we start, you start at, at, at a center node, and let's say it has five nodes that it, that, that it connects to. And you take the top, let's say there's 20 nodes, and you take the top five of those nodes, and you see what those nodes are connected to. And you take the top 10 of those, and you see what those are connected to. And so you can create a series of shells of what nodes are connected to what nodes in that way, right? So you can create, um, you can get a sense of a network of the connectivity. So you can do this at scale. I, I created a smaller version of this so that we can see it running. But you can actually run this code on your laptop without breaking it. So don't worry. It's a small data set. Um, I, I won't. I won't run it. So, so there's two. There's run and write click graph, which will, will which will do the an analysis part, and then there's another one called uh, load uh, click graph, which will. Uh, uh, wait a minute. Let me remember which with the order of operations. Um, yeah. So first you load the data, do some analysis, and then there's another one where you run and run it and write it which actually writes the, the output in a form that you can um, uh, look at with HTML. So then it, what it does is it puts it in this, um, puts it in this site directory. 
um, creates an HTML file based on a template. So it has this, first it creates a JSON file. And then from that JSON file, it creates um, oh. So then it just creates a list of nodes. And then those nodes all have um, things that they're connected to, links. And so that's basically just the output of the graph that it created by searching that clickstream network. And then you can visualize the, um, is it here? There's the, there's the JSON file. And then this is the D3 graph, and you can kind of see what's connected to what. So you can also, if you want to visualize this graph, you can do it with Python. The, if you, um, this graph is in there. If you have 2.7, it's python-m simple HTTP server. And that'll, it's D3, so it has to be served. And um, if it's Python 3, I can't remember what it is, but it's something like that to get a, a server. Um, where'd it go? So this is kind of cool. You can see some of the things that uh, show up in the Wikipedia entry. You've got Watson. You've got um, Google DeepMind is associated with it. You've got, um, and, and funnily enough, it, it you know so you do Watson the computer. It also is, connects to Watson, you know, the guy who discovered DNA. So um, the molecular structure of nucleic acid shows up three clicks away from that. Um, so, so there's some kind of interesting things. In, and th these things are really endlessly fascinating. The Wikipedia click graph, you could, you, could, you could really look at it all day long. But it's connected to Ginny Rometty and then Thomas J. Watson. So there's this whole, you can see this whole ecosystem of IBM and Watson stuff and then um, then there's lots of other things that, that it's connected to. Watson, uh, Jeopardy, and then apparently Weird Al Yankovic was on Jeopardy. I don't know why that was connected, but, um, but some interesting, uh, this is just a kind of a microcosm of what the full clickstream graph, graph looks like. Um, and uh, and so, so, yeah, I guess on that note, maybe I can uh, a answer any questions. And then, you know, I can show you some other stuff offline or you just, you know, ask me later on if, uh, if you have questions, so.